So, so there's nothing about my life that has been normal. And I, I vividly remember one night, I'm in the Buick Regal, I'm eight years old, I'm with my stepfather. My older brother Eric is in the back seat. And we're driving through a neighborhood and we stop. Gentleman approaches the passenger window. I'm barely looking over the window. And he approaches and he has money. And he gives me the money. My stepfather gives me the nod, count the money. And so I'm learning how to count money as an eight year old, 20, 40, 65. No, you, you got it wrong, son. Okay. 20, 40, 60, 80. I counted $200. Told me, good job. I was going to get my winter coat. Wasn't over. So then he gives me a bag. And in that bag, some white substances, I don't know what it is. I'm just learning how to count money. And I pass the bag over to the guy who's in the window. We drive off. The guy disappears. I actually go get my winter coat. This moment in my life is very important to me now. I didn't understand this then. I just knew that a father was doing what a father does. Teach his child how to count money. And I never told my mom this, never told her this at all. Could not tell my mom this. Even three weeks later, as she held myself and my five siblings in front of the television crying as we watched him get put in the police car. Never told her. Needless to say, at the time, that was one of the biggest drug busts in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, there were 22 federal indictments handed down. My stepfather served 17 years in the federal penitentiary. I saw him for the first time in 17 years, three years ago, when he was released. It was a struggle growing up. And I, I, I never knew what my life would amount to. I know that my mom, beautiful woman, she taught me uh, hard work, dedication, working three jobs at a time, three boys, three girls. She taught me patience, six different attitudes from six different kids. And one woman, you got to have some patience with that. And she taught me patience. Endurance. She was determined. Didn't want any assistance. But she was determined to raise men and women who would seek after the Lord. My mom, when I was in high school, for four years in high school, she had her own room one of those years. She sat on the couch, she slept on the couch. Couldn't sneak out the house because my mom's room was right on the couch. <laughs> because she wanted us, three boys and three girls, to have something that we could actually call our own. She taught me hard work. And she said, you know, Gabriel, the way that you're living your life as I got older, it's only going to be for a phase because God is going to use you. Oh, whatever, mom. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Can I have the keys, please, so I can, you know, leave? She always taught me that. Watch the company that you keep. This is only a phase. You're, you're powerful. I love you. God loves you. And I would just go about my way. And so this is a picture of me. Yes, I actually mastered the sag. I was able to walk around and have my pants down without tripping over. And I thought that I was cool. And this is a picture of myself with one of my buddies in high school. And, and the, the thing about it is my mom, she loved me and she did everything that she could for me. But the streets... The music, the videos, those things had more of an influence in my life than my own mother did because it shot straight to my soul and changed my character. So I get a call one night, go back, I'm in the eighth grade, and I get a call, my friend says, Gabe, Gabe, wake up, wake up, man, wake up, Rose's been shot, Rose just got shot, wake up, wake up. 
I'm like, dude, what's going on, man? It's three in the morning. Man, they just shot my brother, man. They just shot him. They just shot him. Who? Who? Man, the Crip shot him. It was a gang fight. 17 years old. Shot twice the side of his head. And I turned on the news down, looked at it, and it rocked my life. Now, I've seen people shot before, even when I was young, but someone that was very close to me, it rocked my life. And so what happened was I um, actually, the next year when I'm in school, I'm sitting down and the teacher's telling me to write something. I'm like, no, I'm not writing anything. Well, you need to talk. No, I'm not talking either. You need to do something. So, well, I don't know what I'm going to do because I don't plan on doing anything. And she says, what is wrong with you? You ever written poetry before? No, poetry's for suckers. I'm not writing poetry. She says, are you sure? I'm positive. I'm not writing poetry. Never knew anything about Edgar Allan Poe, Langston Hughes, Maya Angelou. Didn't know anything about that. But she made me write a poem, and she called it Requiem, which means Song for the Dead. And this is the original piece that I wrote. I was a freshman in high school at the time. That was about uh, 16 years ago. And I never wrote a poem again until I was a freshman in college. I wrote three poems. All three of them degrading women and filling myself up with pride. So then what happened was God isolated me. And somehow, by God's grace, became to know this Savior. And so then I wrote another poem as a Christian, and I'm in front of 1,500 people. I've never read a poem in front of two people before. Now I'm in front of 1,500, like, God, well, maybe my mom was right. You are going to do something with me. Let's go. <laughs> so, so now I'm writing and I'm sharing, and I'm, I'm on a college campus, and I'm, I'm going all over the places telling people of how good God is and how good he's been to me, doing this in the regular stories and regular situations that I've dealt with and that other people have dealt with before. And the thing about spoken word is just an artistic expression of who you are. If I wasn't saved, it would be artistic expression of who I am as a man who's not saved, and we probably would not like my spoken word. But as a believer, my poetry is only an expression of who I am. Spoken word does not make me. But my relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that's what makes me. And so it's, my spoken word is kind of like the moon. It just reflects the sun. Y'all get that later, spoken word kind of stuff. <laughs> so so the, the thing about it is, with spoken word, it's a tool that can be used, and rap as well. It's a tool that can be used to share the gospel. How can rap be used to share the gospel? But the only people who have realized the influence of music are people like Coca-Cola, Chrysler, and Pepsi. And so in their commercials, they kind of get in tune with the culture, meets the culture where it is, and put Snoop Dogg or somebody up to actually talk about their product, and people go get it but the church, throw that stuff out. But it's just like a letter. We can write a letter now that can get us into school. We can write a letter that can get us kicked out of school. Which letter are you writing? And through my arts, I choose to write a letter that talks about Christ. And so everywhere I go, I get a chance to talk and to, to, to minister through spoken word to all kinds of different people. I talked last night with some friends, and you know, I went to a place, and their average age was about 60. 60. Yeah. So, so I had to put the G at the end of my ING words. I wanted to make sure, you know, I didn't use too much slang that we all figured it out, right? So, you know, these are actually kids at one of the concerts who were just like, God, I want to know you or know more about you. And this is all through the art of spoken word. I think about David and all of his writing through song. And I think about because of your love and kindness is better than life, my lips would glorify you. And I feel the same way. I think David was a pretty cool poet, by the way. So I want to glorify God. I just happen to do it in rhyme form, story form, you know, artistic expression, metaphors, but it's the same gospel, same God through a different medium. So I actually got a chance to go back and say hello to Ms. Arsenault. And this is a picture we took a couple of weeks back, and 
she cried, eyes teared up, and I just said, I just want to say thank you. You made me right. And she remembered it, and she remembered how stubborn I was, too. She made sure she'd tell me that. <laughs> and I said, thank you. You have no idea. Because what I did not know was that God was preparing me for this day in 2012. So I signed one of my books to her and just said, thank you. And she said, you better let me see the tape when, when, you know, after you mentioned my name in, in New Mexico. So <laughs> if you will allow me to, I'd like to share some spoken word with you. Can I do that? Yeah. There's a bill that has to be paid. And, and I'm convinced that if it was solely up to us to pay it, don't even bother, homie. Lights off. And if you've never been fortunate enough to experience the fortune of having no electricity, this doesn't matter your gender, your race, or ethnicity, your rank in the ministry, or even your family's history. The intensity is immensely mutual across the board. With that being said, all aboard as I take you to a place that you may not be too distant from. Now watch your step, because I have no insurance. I remember wondering, Mom, are we the only ones who can't see our clothes on school nights and some summer nights and some winter nights, using the glow from the neighbor's Christmas lights to fight off the no-light circumstance that held us captive in our own home? And usually we're draining the car battery, so yo, no flattery here. We just use the headlights just to get a good glimpse of exactly how near we were to each other. But with this same light, with this same light, we captured the tattooed tears that paced down the beautiful cheeks of our mother. She's resting in peace now. Because from what I could see, there was no peace in the hustle and the tussle of trying to make ends meet, only to come up short frequently. I wish we lived in the streets, because even the crickets and the speed bumps were better off than us. At least at midnight, they had street lights. Sometimes you just need a little help. When you just can't pay the bill. This is real as two joker cards in a deck of cards getting lost when you shuffle. Yeah, we will scuffle out of discomfort, but we found comfort in mom's huddle. Innocent curiosity left no muzzle on me, so I would often ask questions that would go unanswered. So my answers were answered through my own answering via assumptions that maybe a small light is better than no light at all. That's how I became familiarized with cheap flashlights and acquainted with those funny looking oil lamps habitually using rose-scented candles on glass plates, letting the candle wax drip down the very same finger that I sucked. Oh, yuck is what I would say, but I loved how that candle wax would magically get stuck and peel off. As our silhouettes dance on and off the walls in our home, if that happened today, I know we will probably just use the glow from our cell phones because beyond the mere reflection of his light, who knows, there's a free app for everything. And, and even though the lens cap was sealed tight, you know us kids can't sit tight, so we tight rope the house. And fright didn't exist in our midst, and eventually we coexisted with the dark in harmony. Persistently assisted its gloomy plot by blowing out those candles and turning off those cheap flashlights and moving away from that hot oil lamp. Because do you want to know what got us amped? What's the fact that we become champs at moving in the dark? which is really a work of art if you think about it. Dancing and smiling and and smiling and dancing where we would once cry and weep, we soon anticipated playing hide and seek because after a while, you just get used to the lights being off. And after the lights being off and on for so long, darkness and I began to get along. So no shame as my friends would spend the night and tag along. We just carry on traveling the broad road at midnight. But the joy... The joy of the lights finally coming on absolutely surpasses our lower class desensitized struggle because this light, this light wasn't about the light in our home, but about a potential home in each of us. And and this is the verdict. 
that the light has come into this world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And I refuse to be one of those people. So when this light came on, when this light came on, I took it. I reflected it. And I chilled on the highest hill that I could climb to shine for those with no power, still looking for the light. Shine on.